All right, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming in out of the rain. I'm Thon, appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm here today to talk about the science behind Nordic skiing, which is one of my favorite sports, but for America, it's usually not one of their favorite sports. But, you know, that's because I think it's just undervalued. And once you see how awesome it is today, I hope you're inclined to go out and try it for yourself. But not today, because it's kind of mushy outside and you'll have a terrible experience. But uh, to start things off, I. I want to retrace my steps a little bit and tell you a little bit how I got into this crazy sport. So thinking back to about 1996 in January. And the 90s were like a, a crazy amount of time ago now. It's just kind of embarrassing to admit. It was like, what, 18 years ago, 1996, around then? And there's not a whole lot that I remember from that time. I think, like, I remember I was excited about Space Jam coming out. You remember that? Yeah. Like, uh, maybe Independence Day was coming out later. I was probably still playing with Pogs or something and wearing neon orange and drinking Surge out of a can. So there's not a whole lot I remember, but uh, I, I do remember this one thing. On, on the weekends, um, my dad would always knock on my door to my room every Saturday morning, and he always had some new character-building experience for me, and also my sister, who is just the, the next room over. Every, mo every morning on Saturday, 8 o'clock in the morning, he would knock on the door and be like, son, because that's what he always called me. He was like, son, it's time to build some character. And he was like either Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird or like the dad from Calvin and Hobbes, if you've ever read Calvin and Hobbes. He's always really concerned about building character. Apparently, I didn't have any character. So you, normally in the springtime or the summertime, he'd knock on my door and say, son, put on your work clothes. It's time to get to work. And he would bring me outside, and I would be rubbing sleep out of my eyes still. The sun was just barely coming up. And he would put me to work taking buckets of dirt, moving them from one place of the yard to the other, getting ready for some obscure yard work that he wanted to accomplish that day. But this being the winter in January, he had a different adventure plan. He knocked my door said, son, come downstairs. Your mother and I have a surprise for you. And that sounded kind of foreboding a little bit, so I wasn't really enthusiastic about what the surprise would be. So my sister and I come downstairs, we look at each other like, do you know what's going on? I have no idea. But we look outside and it's snowing. And I grew up in Buffalo, New York. And if anyone is familiar with the area, you know that there's not a whole lot to be proud of in Buffalo, New York. It's flat, it's boring, it's gray, it's overcast, it's pretty grim overall. But when it's snowing, it looks really nice. You have these fat snowflakes fall from the sky, and you have a couple feet of snow there, and it looks really great, like something out of a postcard. And it was looking nice. And he was, my, my dad opened the door for us, and he said, come on outside, kids. We have a surprise for you. All right. So we go outside, and there he was with my mom, and they held a bunch of really long skis that looked like about this. Something that's long and narrow, it's taller than I was. And they had these pairs of boots that look really old and from the 70s, and they were falling apart, and a couple of poles that came up to about here. They said, Okay, kids, today we're going to teach you how to cross country ski. And I was like, Okay, fine, I'll try this crazy cross country ski thing. So we put on these boots, we put on these skis, they attached with these. these, these really old plastic metal bindings that looked like they were scavenged together from old Soviet technology from the 70s. We put these on, and he says, OK, look at these skis. See the bottoms here? They have this fish scale kind of pattern. Well, oops, hello slides. See this fish scale kind of pattern? Well, you're going to be running kind of, but you're going to be running and shuffling along. And, Whenever you shuffle along, these fish scales are going to dig into the snow, and they're going to give you grip, and that's what's going to propel you forward. And when you glide, you're going to glide on the, the, uh, the tips and the tails of the skis. You see how these are really smooth? So you're going to glide along, and you're going to push off with the bottoms of these skis here. And what you're going to do is you're going to pretend like it, it's a running motion, kind of. You're going to have your opposite arm with the opposite ski, and you're just going to swing your arms and propel yourself forward that way. I was like, OK. So I, I started to do it. They had laid out some trails in our, in our backyard, which sounds nice. But you have to remember that this is suburban Buffalo. We had a, a fairly modest home. And our backyard was about half the size of this room here. So we would go 
up one way, turn at a right hand angle, and then go the other way, and then turn in another uh, 90 degree angle, and then go this way. It was like NASCAR on skis, which sounds pretty boring, and it was for a while. But then we started to dig out, dig out these grooves as we kept skiing along the same tracks. We kept going around and around, and the more we went, the faster we went. And I actually got the hang of it. I really enjoyed it. After a while, I discovered you can just keep going by double poling, by digging your poles into the ground and launching yourself forward that way. My sister gave up after about an hour because she really hates the snow and hates the cold and didn't want anything to do with us, and she went inside. But long after this, this lesson was over, I was skiing long into the night, going back and forth, around and around and around again, dozens of times, maybe like 50 or 100 times even. I don't even know. The sun was setting. It got dark. I just kept going around in a circle. I thought it was great. So that's how I got into skiing. Uh, my parents eventually, towards the late 90s, bought me a pair that was like this. It was still, it's pretty old by today's standards, very much like the skis that I first skied on. And every once in a while, I would go out to the, the back country or a golf course or something. And keep in mind, Buffalo is very flat. So we were just going around on very flat surfaces that sometimes had trees. It looked something like this. And I would see other skiers out here in the back country, and we would just shuffle along at a walking pace through the snow. I thought that's what skiing was. And in my limited world, that's what it was. And I would continued this through high school. I got into other sports. I was a swimmer. That's what I spent most of my time on. But every once in a while, when things got really rough and I was all like, I'm in high school and these problems really matter and you don't understand me, mom, I would take my skis and go out and be by myself and get all that teenage angst out. So that's what I thought skiing was. And then I got to college. I went to college in Colgate University, which is in upstate New York. Think about how. We're in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Well, I was in the equivalent place in New York, just right in the center of the state where there's like nothing around. But there's snow, and that's one of the reasons why I went there, because I love snow, and I was learning to love skiing. And I heard that there is these, these trails up in the, the old golf course that sat atop the hill that our university was on. This old golf course was adjacent to some old running trails that cross-country uh, cross runners would use uh, during their training for their, for their uh, cross-country season. So I take my old skis up there, thinking that there would be a good place to ski. And I get to the top where the trail system began. And this is what I see. I see what effectively is like a, a road made out of snow that snakes through the woods like this. It was long and flat. And it was about the width of this distance between the first row of chairs and the, the, um, the, uh, the screen here. It was covered with this weird corduroy pattern. And there are these two divots off to a side. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I was like, what, what is this? I, I'm assuming this is for skiing, I guess. It kind of looked like snowmobiles or something went over it. So maybe it's a snowmobile trail. I'll just go off to the side in these little grooves here that seem to be at the right width for my feet. So I, I go into these grooves, and I start shuffling along because I had this old equipment that's pretty slow. And this is what I thought what skiing was. And then all of a sudden, around the bend, I see two skiers that look like this. And they're flying at me really fast, like 30 miles an hour, it seems. They're going downhill, so that helped, too. But they're doing this weird skating motion. It was like they had rollerblades attached to their feet. But instead of rollerblades, it was these, these very short skis that were very skinny. And they had these long, thin poles that went up to their chins. And they were very aggressively poling with every stride skating back and forth and propelling themselves along this, this, this road of snow. I've never seen anything like this before. It was fast. It was cool looking. It looked like it was from like an old Nike commercial or something. And I talked to these people afterwards. And we exchanged our histories with uh, snow sports, skiing in particular. And they told me about this, this skate style that they were doing. And they said, hey, we're having a race next week. Do you want to come? I said, OK. So we did this race. We got a talk in. They introduced me to the skating technique. I bought a pair of these skate skis myself. I bought longer poles that go with them. And I learned a little bit the hard way, mostly, about how skiing is done. And as a scientist, I started to get into a little bit about how the mechanics of skiing works, the dynamics of the sport, the science behind it. And that's what I'm going to talk about 
with the remaining time that I have here. So in case you haven't seen what skiing really looks like, cross-country skiing, it looks like this. It's a lot faster than you would think. It's very aggressive. This, in particular, is a sprint. It's about one kilometer distance. And it looks like they're just flying through the snow, which is essentially what's happening. Now, these hills that they're going up and down are a little bit steeper than what it looks like here. And you can see, much like with downhill, they go into a tuck position to conserve energy and to prevent too much uh, air resistance from slowing them down. And you can see it's kind of like a, a roller coaster, this course here in Oslo. This was the World Cup from 2011. So it's a, a good way to think about how skiing works in terms of physics is like a roller coaster. You think back to when you ride roller coasters when you were a kid. You, you spend all this time climbing up this one side here, getting to the top of a hill. And then this mechanical system that takes you up to the top of the hill lets go, and you're free to fall down and do the rest of the roller coaster. You know implicitly from your experience that somehow being at the top of a heart, large hill gives you a sort of energy that is released and propels you down to do the remainder of the roller coaster. And that's what skiing is kind of like. It's essentially a roller coaster of snow. And any other sliding sports, like luge, bobsled, alpine skiing, is, uh, relies on, the, on this central principle, the principle of the conservation of energy. See, cross-country skiers, I, you know, I had to use a bicyclist here because I didn't find any cross-country skiing graphics. Cross-country skiing relies on the conservation of energy, much like anything else does in our universe. You have a certain kinetic energy when you go up the hill. Kinetic energy is, is energy of motion. You have a certain amount of energy that is, a, is uh, about how fast you're going. And you apply that energy to climb the hill. And in this simple case, let's say you, you apply as much energy as it takes to climb up to the hill to just come to a stop up here. Here, you've converted all your kinetic energy, energy of motion, to what we call potential energy, an energy that you have potential to do further work with if you release it somehow. The energy of motion that you have going in is from the, the arrangements of molecules in your body, the food that you eat, combined with the air that you're breathing. The energy implicit in all these different systems works together to propel yourself up the hill. Kinetic energy gets stored into potential energy, specifically potential gravitational potential energy, which has to do with how high you are up, how massive you are. So this potential energy here can be released again into kinetic energy. And you're aware of this every time you drop something. If I hold a ball or anything or a coffee cup, I know that raising it up, I'm doing work. I'm storing energy in a gravitational potential sense. It has potential to do something. And if I release it, I release that energy, which gets converted into kinetic energy as it falls towards the ground, which is what happens here. A bicyclist or a skier goes up the hill, and if you're a downhill skier, you take the lazy way, and something else turns kinetic energy, a ski lift, into gravitational potential energy, energy you just have being atop a hill. And when you go down, you're converting that energy again. You're changing it from potential back into kinetic energy, to energy that goes out. And that's the fundamental principle. I found that in practice, the best ski courses, the best loops that you can do through the woods are those that you start with a high hill to gain as much potential energy as you can, so you release that as kinetic energy. And if you play your cards right, that kinetic energy will help you climb any further hills and help you go as fast as you can to complete your ski course. Now, the energy that you supply, like I said before, is all kinetic. So the energy in here is kinetic energy. In a very simple case, an ideal case, it's all kinetic. And then that is converted to a potential energy at the top of the hill. In physics, we always use the letter U to describe potential energy. And since you want to go as fast as you can, you don't want to just stop at the top of the hill you want to keep going. So you have a little bit of content, uh, pot uh, kinetic energy here at the top of the hill, too. Now, coming down, oops, coming down, go back, all this energy here, the kinetic energy you have at the top of the hill, energy of motion, combined with this potential energy, 
energy of how high you are up from the, from the baseline here, the ground, gets converted into kinetic energy as you go down. So at the end of the day, the amount of kinetic energy, how fast you're going, depends on how high this hill is and how hard you work to, to go up that hill. Now this is an ideal case too because, as you know, not everything is perfect and you lose energy to friction. You lose energy when you're, for, like, let's say, pretty uncertain about how you're going up that hill if you're skiing for the first time. You know what I'm talking about. You're all wobbly and you're losing energy because you're trying to balance. So there's going to be energy losses that have to be taken into account. So just to show you here, you have a kinetic energy, which has to do with how fast you're going. That's a velocity here, a speed that's squared. That gets converted to a potential energy plus whatever energy you have from your motion going over the hill. This, top, this uh, velocity at the top of the hill plus a potential energy here, which depends on how high the hill is, depends on your mass, m. It also depends on this constant g, which has to do with how massive the Earth is. And these things you can't change, of course. And then coming out, you have a certain velocity out, which has to do with how high this hill is, because you've converted that potential to kinetic energy, and how fast you're going on the way down. Now, when you include all these things that might trip you up, energy losses and such from friction, well, the energy that you apply going in has to do with how fast you move, of course, this kinetic energy of motion, and that's going to be minus whatever energy you lose from friction. You're heating up the snow as you move around on it. You're wobbling around. You're converting, uh, you're not efficiently converting energy from oxygen and food into kinetic energy. And by the conservation of energy, because you don't get something from nothing, this is going to be equal to how much kinetic energy you have at the top of the hill, the speed going over the top of the hill, and how much potential energy you've gained by climbing that hill. Now, equating these two terms here, we have that the kinetic energy at the top plus the potential energy at the top is equal to the kinetic energy you put in minus any energy losses. Now, I've put this in, in gray here because you can't do anything to change the potential energy. You personally don't change the height of the hill. You don't change your mass all that much, and you don't change the properties of the Earth. So this is going to be great. You don't have control of this. What you do have control over is the kinetic energy you put in and how much you have to lose. So just solving for energy at the kinetic energy at the top of the hill, because you want to go as fast as you can. You want this to be as big as possible. That's going to be equal to how much kinetic energy you put in, how fast you go, minus whatever energy you lose, minus whatever potential energy you gain from the hill. And you can see that to make this as big as possible, you can't change this, so we don't worry about that. You're going to want as big of kinetic energy going in as possible, speed, you want to go as fast as possible, and you want very minimal energy losses. So that's going to be low friction, that's going to be more control over your body and the skis, and it's going to be a, an efficient conversion of oxygen and food into energy of motion. Similarly, as you go down the hill here, you're converting this energy that you have at the top, whatever speed you're going at, and the potential energy of that hill, to kinetic energy coming out. And that's going to be equal to whatever speed you go out in and what additional work you put in to offset any, um, to offset any losses in kinetic energy, or if you want to just keep moving as fast as you can. There's going to be an extra kinetic energy that you apply. That's why I put that in red there. Now, you can equate these two terms like we did over here. The amount of energy you have up here is the amount of energy you have here. And if you solve for what you have coming out in terms of kinetic energy, that's going to be equal to the kinetic energy at the top plus whatever you've gained in potential energy climbing that hill minus whatever you, whatever additional kinetic energy you have to supply to keep going down the hill. So again, this energy that you lose, whether you're going up or going down, you want to make that as small as possible. So what this means in practice is you're going to have to have low friction. You're going to have to have low friction in two different ways, from air friction and from the friction of your ski against the snow. Now, 
as you see with, with uh, cross-country skiers going downhill, like in the previous video, and in any alpine skiing that you've seen, a lot of times skiers go into a tuck position to minimize their cross-section, they minimize their size that the, the air sees as it rushes towards them. Now, air friction is a complex thing that is determined by how massive you are, the size that you present to the air around you, has to do with how fast you're going. It's a complex thing. But you, normally, uh, the tuck will help you out in these situations. For snow friction, that's going to have to do with how your ski is built, what technique you're using, and what wax or special substance you apply to the bottoms of the skis to make them go faster. And we'll talk about each of those things. Now, I mentioned that there are two different types, techniques, of skiing. There's the classical technique, which is what I was first familiar with before I learned how to skate. And that's the kind that most people see, most people are familiar with when they think cross-country skiing. So there's a diagonal stride, which is like a kind of a running uh, type of technique, and also the um, double poling kind of technique that you just saw. And there's different varieties for different types of snow and different types of uh, terrain. But this is the basic picture here. You're, you're, in a sense, shuffling and gliding as you go across the snow. For classical technique, you use a ski that's more or less like this. Oftentimes, they're a little bit uh, longer than this ski that I use. Now, this ski is pretty flexible. It's got a camber to it. It's got a, a bendiness kind of property to it. And this is important because you glide on this part of the ski and this part of the ski here, the tails and the tips. And as you notice here, if you look very carefully, you'll see that the skier bends down, it flexes to bend the ski so that the middle part, the kick zone, touches the snow. And this kick zone has either a sticky kind of wax on it or has fish scales, like in my old backcountry skis here. And that kick zone grips the snow and allows the skier to propel himself forward, like this. And the poles that one uses are not all that different from poles one would use in backcountry skiing. They come up to about, about here thereabouts. They're raised a little bit as you sink into this, the, the tracks that uh, the grooming machine will put into the snow. But that's the general motion that you're familiar with. And also, just to point this out, because I brought my boots here too, the classical boot is, it looks like a, like a high top boot, but actually the, uh, the support is very low. You have a lot of ankle um, flexibility, which is important because you want to be able to compress that ski to the snow and launch yourself forward. So ankle flexibility is going to be important. And the other technique called skate, and this is another uh, mass start kind of event where everyone starts at once and it's a huge mess. And honestly, I have no idea how people are not stabbed in the face by other skiers' poles in this sort of situation. And skate, it's a much more aggressive kind of stride. It's a much more aggressive kind of skating, uh, skiing technique where the skis that you use are shorter, they're narrower, they're faster, and they're waxed with a glide wax, a slippery kind of substance, from tail to tip. So in this ski, there's no uh, sticky kick wax that's going to um, stick you to the snow and propel you forward. Your motion is just from skating, essentially. If any of you have tried uh, rollerblading or roller skating, it's a similar kind of motion. And you'll notice also that the poles are a little bit higher. Which ones are my poles here? Uh, one seven, yeah, there we go. And the poles are a little bit higher because you're generally, you're up more, you're going to be double pulling, and you're going to be harnessing the core muscles and your strong muscles in your back, your lats, to propel yourself forward. It's a very aggressive kind of stride. And as you can see, it, it depends what kind of terrain you have, whether you want to double pull every uh, stride that you take with your feet or every other stride. And sometimes the V you make with the skis is wide if you're trying to climb up a hill. And it's very narrow if you're going really fast. And sometimes you'll just tuck and relax a little bit after climbing up a hill when you're going back down. But that's the basics of skate. And for 
the boots, the boots are similar to the kinds of boots you used with classical, but they have a higher stiff cuff here because you're skating, you want to keep your ankles more locked into place. You don't want to be, you know, losing energy going to side to side and trying to keep your ankles, uh, you know, nice and straight here. What's important is you're going to want to have flexibility going this way because you're storing energy in your legs like a spring, but you don't want to have to waste energy keeping yourself up as you're going side to side which is why we have a stronger cuff on the skate boot. So those are the two techniques. As you'll notice, skate is generally faster. It's more energy intensive. I find it to be the most tiring, but it's faster. And there's a fundamental reason why. If you look at a classical skier, the diagonal stride, the shuffling back and forth kind of stride, You'll notice that for the, at the briefest of instant, there's a time when the ski comes to a complete stop. The skier is moving forward, and the skis move forward, but in order to press down the kick zone into the snow and propel yourself forward, there's going to be an instant of time where that ski stops and then goes backwards. I mean, it's the same with running. There's a time when your foot keep, goes forward, there's a time when your foot briefly stops, and there's a time when your foot goes backwards. So this change in speed, going forward, stopping, and going backwards, and going forward again, stopping, going backwards, implies a change of momentum, a change of forward motion of your ski. A change in momentum means you're going to have a change in the kinetic energy moving forward. And when you change your kinetic energy a lot, you have less overall kinetic energy when you're going up a hill, for instance. It's, there's less, when you change your uh, momentum, you're changing your speed, you're changing your kinetic energy, you have less forward motion propelling you towards the end of the race. Unlike with skate skiing, where you're spending effort going a little bit side to side with your skis, but in all cases with skate skiing, your skis are always going forward. They're never going back. There's less of a change in momentum. There's less of a change in forwardness to your skiing. So that's why this technique is ultimately faster. Now, into the material science of how all this stuff works, there's been a, a lot of talk in the cross-country skiing industry about carbon fiber. And you're seeing this across all sports. A lot of protective equipment, a lot of, um, a lot of equipment that's used to keep your body in, in place in a variety of different sports. A lot of things are being made out of carbon fibers, and which is fairly common thing now, and that's because carbon is very light. This pole here is very, very light. Carbon fiber is a, it's a light substance. Carbon atoms are very light. If you look at the periodic table of elements, they come at number six, basically, carbon atoms. And if you look at how carbon atoms are distributed in carbon fiber, they're they share a lot of electrons with each other. They form these complex rings, these long strands. And the more bonds they have with each other, the stronger their connection is to each other. They have a type of bond, a covalent bond, that they share electrons with. And that bond is the strongest of all the bonds between atoms. And when you have these long chains of carbon atoms, they're very rigid. They're very strong. If you imagine taking these, these these nanotubes here, or these long strands, and trying to break them apart. It's going to be very difficult to do, because you have all these atoms sharing electrons with each other. So they're very stiff. They don't bend very easily, and they make a great substance for building poles out of. And also with boots, too. My boots here are cheaper, and they're made out of plastic. But a lot of modern boots now are made out of carbon fiber, which are good, because again, you want a certain uh, rigidity and these cuffs here, so you don't, you know, you're not sliding all over the place. You're keeping your ankle firmly locked. But in terms of skis, skis are generally not made out of carbon fiber. Some alpine skis are wrapped with carbon fiber, so they have a certain torsional rigidity and they don't chatter as much against the snow. But for Nordic skiing, it's a different story, which is why I have this video here, which shows you a little bit about how Cross it's done. Cross-country skis used to look pretty much all the same long, narrow, and wooden. Today's skis, however, come in many different styles, specifically designed for the many types of cross-country. Telemark, backcountry, all-terrain, touring, and racing. <laughs> Our 
archaeologists in Scandinavia have uncovered ski artifacts 5,000 years old. These Stone Age skis had enabled people to hunt during the winter. Skiing became so vital a means of transportation that the Vikings worshipped a god and goddess of skiing. 19th century Scandinavian soldiers wore skis in winter warfare. They held races in their spare time, turning cross-country skiing into a popular sport. From there, it just snowballed. Ah, get it? Snowball? One way to make cross-country skis is compression molding, a process that uses heat and pressure to bond the components together. First, a computer-guided blade cuts out what will become the ski's underside, called the gliding surface. It's made of pre-assembled fiberglass laminate and polyethylene thermoplastic, a friction-resistant material. They lay it into the bottom half of a mold, then glue on steel edges for grip. This spray makes the adhesive dry faster so that they can apply the principal adhesive, epoxy. A rubber shock absorber goes on the back, followed by a durable plastic reinforcement called the heel piece protector. The ski's wooden core is made of aspen and birch laminated together. Next comes a sheet of fiberglass impregnated with epoxy for extra reinforcement. The wood core is now sandwiched between two high resistance layers. Then for decoration, a plastic film with a silk screen design. With everything now in the bottom half of the mold, they can clamp on the top and tape it up to ensure nothing shifts out of place. Then it's into a press that compresses the mold and heats it to 85 degrees Celsius. This activates the epoxy, hardening it in 12 to 15 minutes, depending on the thickness of the ski. Now they do a rough cut to trim off the excess. Then they sand all the edges until they're smooth. They run just the gliding surface across a grinding stone that white object you see below. This extra step is only for the higher end models. It's pretty common actually, it's Another not just for higher end Another way to make cross-country skis is by a process called reaction injection mold. Well, I think we can stop it there. The bottom line is that skis have a lightweight core, which uh, is wood, which sounds kind of backwards and a little bit old school, but remember you're looking for a substance that's light, that's rigid, and has some bend to it because skis always need camber. Skis need uh, a certain bendiness. And that's usually achieved with a wood core. Sometimes there's fiberglass, sometimes there's a combination, sometimes there's a foam injected fiberglass method, but that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Now downhill skis don't have that bendiness. They're flat because all you care about is going downhill. You don't care about springing your legs into action to propel yourself uphill, which is why cross-country skis have a kind of a wavy uh, profile to them. Now I mentioned before about friction and how you want to minimize that. Well, let's take a look here. Imagine you're applying force to a ski to accelerate yourself forward. You want to go at a certain velocity along the snow. So you have to accelerate to, in order to achieve that velocity. But there's going to be friction. Friction is always going to be a force that's trying to push you in the other direction. And you need to overcome that friction. You need to overcome that friction twice. You need to overcome a static friction that's holding you back when you first try to propel yourself forward. And you need to overcome a kinetic friction that's going to keep trying to hold you back as you keep moving. And in both cases, those are given by a certain simple formula, like this, that has to do with two terms. This N is a normal force, which depends on how much you weigh and uh, how you're climbing up a hill, what angle you're approaching the snow. But 
when you're on flat ground like this, the normal force is just how much you weigh. And it all has to do, also has to do with this one number, this letter here, Greek letter mu, which is called the coefficient of friction. It's just the number that you use to make your normal force, your frictional force, lower. And you want that number as low as possible, right? The lower this number is, the lower the um, combination of these two terms is, the lower the friction is. So you can see here, there's a couple of different coefficients of friction based on two substances rubbing against each other. And waxed skis on snow have a pretty low coefficient of friction. So this is, this is going to mean that your friction against the snow is going to be very low, which is good. You want to be able to slide effortlessly. Now this is kind of on average-ish. In practice, the coefficient of friction depends on how, uh, how you've waxed your ski. It depends on what your ski is made of. And it can actually vary between numbers of 0 0.001 and something like 0.3, which, you know, these are, sound like just numbers, but they have a profound difference. The difference between these coefficients of friction is the difference between sliding 25 meters before stopping or sliding 9 meters before stopping. If you go at 5 miles an hour and you stop putting any effort into it, you could be slowed down to a complete stop in 25 meters or 9 meters, depending on how you've waxed your skis and how your skis are set up. Now think about that. That's just, I mean, that's a long distance. 25 meters versus 9 meters. And that adds up over these 30 kilometer races that skiers sometimes ski. So it is of paramount importance to get that number as low as possible. And that has to do with waxes. It has to do with how your base is set up. It has to do with waxing. Now the base of the ski, as you saw in the video, is a, a stone ground polyethylene base which is a low friction substance. If you, you know, took your hands and slid them across, it, this, the ski base would feel pretty slippery, which is good. You don't want it to stick to anything. You want it to slide. And the reason why we have different waxes that we apply, waxes like this hydrocarbon wax here, I have a whole box of them over here. Why we have different waxes? Well, we have different snow types. Now I think about this and I, I think, well, you know, there's a reason why all the best cross-country skiers come from Scandinavian countries that have like 12 different words for snow, right? Because all the dif different words for snow apply to different types of snow. And we just have snow. But there's so many types of snow and they require different waxing techniques. Different ways that you iron a hot wax onto the ski and smooth it out and scrape and everything else. And we've all seen different shapes of snowflakes. We all know intuitively that snow is, is different depending on how it's made and how it transforms. Here's a quick summary of that. There's kind of a, a type one of snow, a new fallen snow that has that, that characteristic uh, light fluffy appearance that you always make when you take a piece of paper, fold it up and cut it around a couple times. It's the kind of snowflake that you get. And they look, you know, feathery and soft and really pleasant, but actually these are, these are these are sharp edges. They will cut you. They will cut into your ski. And there's a certain type of wax that you need in order to get around that snow from cutting into your ski and sticking to it. And as this snow ages, imagine you have a snowfall and then you wait hours or a day or so, this snow will transform. The moisture will be retracted inwards. The, the snowflake will change over time. It will become a, a more uh, crystallized looking kind of shape like this. And this happens if snow just sits out and there's no sudden change in temperature or anything. Now, the, the, the longer you wait, the more transformed it's going to be and the less snowflakey it's going to look. It's going to start to look like you know, octagons and hexagons and shapes like that. And these shapes stick to skis differently and you need to wax according to that. And depending on whether it warms up again or freezes and warms up and then freezes again, you have snow with different properties. You have this wet corn snow that has a lot of water around it. And water sticks to skis differently than snow does, so you need to account for that. Or you have this really frozen corn snow that's been frozen and melted and frozen a couple times, so it's like little, little ice cubes that are, you know, scraping away at the bottom of your ski as you go by. And these have all different friction properties that we need to take into account. And 
generally, as a rule, there's two types of waxes that you can use for gliding purposes that will take into account these different types of snow. There's the hard wax, and then there's more softer waxes. And it's more complicated than that, but this is a good general picture. Hard wax is used for cold conditions, for snow that stays frozen. It's, it's easy to think about this because hard wax, hard snow. Soft wax, soft snow. What makes hard wax hard? Well, it melts at a, at a higher temperature. It's rather hard. It's very brittle. It prevents the snow from chipping away at it. And it's made of these long hydrocarbon chains. There could be 50, upwards of 50 or more of these hydrocarbon groups in long chains. They're very sturdy molecules. They don't melt very well. They're not chipped away very well. And they're made of these, these microcrystalline structures, too, which you know, look complicated, but just think long chains of hydrocarbons that are resistant from snow trying to cut away at it. Meanwhile, for softer waxes, softer waxes are, are made from very small molecules, shorter chains of, hyd of hydrocarbons, and other things like paraffin, which is a type of soft wax. You know, think of a candle. It's very soft. It melts easily. And these will help deal with the different types of snow that you have. And it's, it, it gets complicated dealing with all the different types of waxes out there. Personally, I still consider myself a novice because I just don't have the patience to deal with all of this stuff. So there's a different, types of wax, different type of wax, a different hardness of wax, depending on what temperature you use. And, and it depends what color you want. Uh, and that depends on what the, the snow conditions are like, what the temperature is. And if you have the money, you can buy fancy waxes that are made more of fluorocarbons, these long molecules that have fluorine atoms instead of hydrogen, as opposed to hydrocarbons. Now, uh, these fluorinated hydrocarbons are, are better overall. And there's, there's a, you know, it's a complex reason why. It's called the electronegativity of different types of atoms. But the way to think about this is that this hydrogen atom here, this hydrogen atom here, all of them, they only have one electron, right? It's the first element in the periodic table of elements. It has one electron that it can share with this carbon atom down here. OK, so sometimes that electron is going to be hanging out on this side of the atom. Sometimes it's going to be hanging out on this side of the atom. Now, electrons are these complex series of probabilities of electrons existing in different places at different times. It's quantum mechanics is a whole crazy thing. But generally speaking, this electron is going to be hanging out on this side of this atom more than that side. So overall, if it's one electron is going to be over here, this proton that's at the center of this atom is going to be effectively naked on this side. There's going to be a positive charge hanging out here uh, overall throughout time. And when you have a net positive charge, you have a kind of a, a, a dipole, we like to say. It's, there's going to be a plus side of this molecule, and there's going to be a negative side of this molecule. And if you have a net charge, you attract opposite charges of anything else. Things like dirt and dust and uh, water molecules are also dipoles. They have a net uh, plus side on one side of the atom, or on the molecule, and a minus side on the other side of the molecule. So when you have a plus side, it, it attracts a minus side, and these, atoms, uh, these molecules start to stick together, which is what you don't want. You don't want things sticking together. Sticking together means plus and minuses are attracting. You don't want that at all. You want something that's as electrically neutral as possible, which is where fluorine comes in. Fluorine has a lot of electrons to share, but it only needs to share you know, one or two of those with this, this carbon atom here. And when it does that, it has a bunch of other electrons just hanging around, zooming around the fluorine atom here, the, the series of protons and neutrons that are inside. So if you take away one, one electron, it still has a bunch of others to, to deal with that shield the, proton from the, out, the protons from the outside. So then this chain of fluorocarbons here is just neutral, which is good. Neutral things don't really stick to any other things. So this wax chain here is not going to stick to snow. It's not going to stick to water, which is what you want when you want to glide. And you might have seen this corduroy pattern in the slide that I showed you before. And what this goes to show is that on a flat surface of snow, it's nice for gliding, for skate skiing, because you're, you know, you're just gliding across this, this snowy road. This corduroy pattern, well, 
the reason that this is here is that it provides you a, a little bit of traction. As your ski digs in to the snow here, only sink down like a tenth of an inch or so. And as you start to angle off and push off to the side, your ski will dig in to these, uh, to these corduroy patterns here, and it'll give you some traction, something to push off. That's the reason why that pattern is there. Now, for classical skis, skis that, classical skis that don't have that uh, fish scale pattern that backcountry skis often do, there's a certain zone in here that I mentioned before called the kick zone, which starts at about here, around the heel, and about uh, 80 centimeters or so up from where this binding ends. So about here is the kick zone. And instead of glide wax, you choose a different kind of wax, a kick wax that is opposite from glide wax in the sense that it's made of really, really, really small hydrocarbon chains that are very sticky. And this wax here, which comes in these little, little cans that are much more expensive than you think they should be, this kind of wax is really sticky. It's almost like a liquid at room temperature. You coat this at the bottom of your ski, and this wax has weird properties in that it has a high coefficient of static friction, but a low coefficient of kinetic friction. It's kind of interesting to think about. Because you're going to need, whenever you stop your ski, you need to press down. You need to stop the ski, press down, uh, activate that kick zone, and stick to the snow so you can propel yourself forward. You need that stickiness when you stop, static friction, but you don't need that stickiness when you move, kinetic friction. So it's a very interesting substance. And again, much like with glide waxes, it depends on temperature, it depends on snow type, it is like super complicated. And this small set of waxes that I have in here is only a tiny subset of this huge universe of environmentally unfriendly waxing that you have available to you. And when conditions get really bad, like in Pennsylvania all the time, you know, there's an even more specialized kind of wax that has a much higher uh, coefficient of static friction. You use clister. And this stuff is like, it's terrible. It's syrupy. It's like molasses. I didn't even bring it in here because I hate it so much. It's, it is a like liquid wax at room temperature that gets everywhere, and it sticks to literally everything. And you need something this sticky when you're dealing with this wet, sloppy, hardened corn snow that's really icy and it's really digging into everything and nothing else will work <laughs> but clister. But again, uh, I try to avoid it whenever possible, so I didn't bring any in. But this is like the, the far, e far end of things that stick to snow. Now, whoa, yikes. Lastly, one thing I want to show you as I disappear from the screen here is that this looks hard, doesn't it? All this ski stuff. And skiing gets a bad rap for being like the hardest sport ever. And it's, in a sense, it's true. You need to be a crazy endurance athlete, which is why I'd like to, sh to end by showing you this quick film from NBC and NSF about the science of being a skiing athlete. The United States hasn't won an Olympic medal in cross-country skiing since 1976, but in 2010, several skiers hope to change that. If they're successful, you can be certain it's due to their incredible endurance. As Olympic athletes, trainers, and a sports scientist and chemists funded by the National Science Foundation explain, cross-country skiers are among the fittest athletes in the world. <laughs> Cross-country skiing is a sport known for pushing its athletes to the limits of human endurance. You have to build the nuts to want to push your body so hard and just really push yourself to the point where you collapse at the finish line. Whether the event is a nearly one-mile sprint or more than a 30-mile race, these Olympians are considered to be among the most aerobically fit athletes in the world. Cross-country skiing involves using both your legs and your arms. So almost all the muscle groups of your body are being used to ski. And that means you have to supply energy to all the muscles in your body as you ski. 
What supplies energy to muscles? During intense exercise, an athlete sucks oxygen into the lungs, which is then pumped by the heart throughout the body in the bloodstream. When oxygen reaches the muscles, it combines with an enzyme called ATP, the carrier of chemical energy within the cell, to produce muscle contractions, which allows movement. Olympic cross-country skiers can, with practice, improve this biochemical process. What they've essentially done is train their body in how to be more efficient in taking up oxygen and actually transferring that oxygen to be used at the cell level in the whole ATP to energy conversion. But even the fittest of the fit have limits to how much oxygen their bodies can process, a peak measured by what's known as VO2 max. VO2 max stands for the volume of oxygen that an athlete can consume when they're exercising maximally. So the maximum volume of oxygen that the lungs can actually grab, consume, and send off the muscles. At the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association Center for Excellence in Park City, Utah, athletes undergo VO2 max testing up to three times a year to measure their maximum aerobic capacity. Troy Flanagan is the center's sports science director. We want to know whether that training is actually effective or not whether it's increasing the size of their aerobic capacity. The test is done on a treadmill with the athlete hooked to special equipment that measures volume of air taken in and amount of oxygen consumed and other physiological factors. It's a quick but painful test because it pushes athletes to the absolute limit of their ability to consume and process oxygen. We can pretty much max an endurance athlete out in about six to eight minutes. Uh, which sounds amazing when these athletes normally train for six to eight hours in the woods uh, on snow, so you can imagine how hard this test is. Liz Stephen, a member of the U.S. cross-country team who did a partial VO2 max test for our cameras, explains how she copes with the pain. It's a mental game for me. You know, your body can do a certain amount, and from there, it's up here. During the test, the treadmill slowly but steadily rises until Stephen it's her max. When the yellow line plateaus out, means that the, the, no matter how much air you're breathing in and out, your lungs cannot consume any more oxygen. To ensure a true max has been reached, the test continues until the athlete no longer can. I don't usually remember too much about the last minute. You're kind of just hanging on for dear life, and all of a sudden, you're done. Compared to athletes from other endurance sports, Cross-country skiers have, on average, the highest VO2 maxes. For Stephen, the test is important personal data about her aerobic training. I really believe it's just a test, and some people, you know, test really long, some people don't. And um, I think for me, it's I use it to see improvement for myself. On race day, aerobic capacity is just one of many factors determining which athlete will be able to push to the upper limits of human endurance perhaps become an Olympic champion. All right. Well, that's about as much as I have to show today. I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, it's, cross country skiing is an extreme sport. It's not extreme in the same way that all this slope style, snow cross, half pipe, snowboarding X Games stuff that's taking over the Olympics now is extreme. But it's extreme in the ways that athletes are most extremely fit. It's most extremely difficult, especially going up hills. But ultimately, it's the most extremely award, uh, rewarding. It's personally, having done downhill and cross country, I've, I've found that it's more fun going down the hill when you've earned it by going up the hill first. And for an extreme country like America, I would hope that an extreme sport like cross-country skiing would be an extreme match. But uh, hopefully, with the help of this video, one day we'll get there. So thanks. <laughs>